Mailbag. Nothing personal word of the day is mailbag. It's the end of another month. Getting ready for Thanksgiving. Depending on when you're listening to this, you may be digesting your Thanksgiving meal right now or it's tomorrow. End of month, what we do is every month, we will answer your questions. Here's how to do it. Go to Apple Podcasts. Rate Nothing Personal five stars if you don't mind. Write a review of the show. And within the review, ask a question. Different from the So You Want to Talk to Samson, where there's a question on a specific topic, mailbags are more general questions. More questions that are, we call them in the business, evergreen, where they can be answered any particular day on any particular subject. Anything you want to talk about. Anything you want to hear me talk about. And I just... Choose some of your questions, and I answer them right now. And I just want to keep going because I love these end-of-month mailbags. You guys have some of the great questions ever. The first one for today's show is a question that is asked all the time in front offices when we sit around, when we're on team planes, when we are in the clubhouse, when we're just shooting it around. The question is this. I got a question, maybe for NP. In your opinion... In which sports, football, baseball, basketball, et cetera, is it hardest to be a GM? Thank you for asking that. Let's get right to it. The thing that makes being a general manager in basketball and football harder than baseball is the salary cap. The salary cap does not exist in baseball where it does in football and basketball, and it requires an understanding of how to get around the salary cap. And that is a skill set that you don't need in baseball. Now, you do have people who work with you in football and basketball who are in the front office whose sole job is to understand the salary cap, talk to you as the GM about what the salary cap is, and then to make sure that anytime you do a sign or anytime you do a trade, you are looking at your salary cap for this year, next year, the year after, et cetera. In baseball, GMs have to keep track of one, three, and five-year payrolls just to, for the owner for budgetary purposes, but there is no penalty for miscalculations. In baseball, you've got the luxury threshold, the luxury tax threshold, but that's not something that you need to be smart about. It's a number, and salaries are calculated in baseball. You actually get a piece of paper which says, this is what your luxury tax payroll is. And it goes player by player, amount by amount. You look at the bottom. If you're a team like the Marlins or like 26 teams, you don't really pay much attention because you're not even close to it, to that cap, to that luxury tax threshold. But in football and in basketball, it is a constant juggle for how to stay under the cap, how to maximize your cap space, And then you have all the issues with dead cap space. When you release a player, what counts towards the cap, what doesn't count towards the cap, and how you get around the cap. So that, by definition, is harder. What makes being a GM in baseball harder than basketball is the mere number of players. That's harder than football, actually, as well. Although football has a bigger roster than the major league roster, The reality is that a baseball GM has to keep track of a major league roster as well as all the minor league rosters. So you are carrying around with you all sorts of different rosters. You've got several hundred players. Of course, there's going to be minor league contraction, which is another issue, which we've talked about in Nothing Personal. But the reality is you're keeping track of more, more players. And the more players you have to keep track of, the harder it is to keep track. 162 verse 82 verse 16. Don't underestimate the difficulty in being a GM when your team is playing 162 times versus when your team is playing 16 times. The upside of a 16-game season is that you have fewer days that are quote-unquote game days because as a GM, your responsibility on game days is much more significant than any other day. You are making sure your roster is ready, that it's set, that it's healthy. You've submitted your roster who's active And when you're only doing it 16 times, that stress by definition is smaller. We have that stress in baseball every day. We have to make sure we have our roster and the system set up correctly. We have to make sure we have the right number of players that are active. We have to follow the disabled list, which is now called the injured list in baseball. 
all these different, I, what I call them is roster management. Roster management in baseball is way harder than roster management in basketball and in football. What about number of employees? One of the jobs of a general manager is that they manage a large group of employees. In baseball, there is a huge number. Your minor league pitching coordinator, your single A trainer, your area scout in Topeka, Kansas, your pro scout in the Southeast region, your hitting coach at the big league level, your analytics department, your scouting development. There are so many employees you have to keep track of from a human resources standpoint, more so in my view than in the other sports. Now there are some bulked up departments in football and basketball, but when you look at the overall number of employees, I would argue dollars for donuts that a baseball GM has a larger HR issue than any of the other sports. What about general rules? I'd say that's a tie between football and baseball with basketball coming in third. There are so many things to keep track of when you are a baseball GM during the course of a game. And because there's so many more games, we used to carry around. I had a hard copy with me and we'd have it in the suite. We'd have it on the road. We, it would be with us at all times. We'd have it at home because the rule book is so complicated that you literally need a degree just to read it understand it and follow it. Now we've got people to help us, but the GM is responsible. If there is a rule violation and you lose a draft pick or you lose a player or you are in violation that causes a player to have more service time than he would have had, therefore get paid more money faster than he would have gotten paid. That's something that you have to worry about much more so in baseball. I guess I'm coming to the conclusion that being a GM in baseball is harder than being a GM in football and basketball because of all the reasons I stated. But of course, you may think I'm saying that because that's my experience. And I would tell you that I've met and spent time with many GMs in the other sports, many presidents in the other sports. And we all think that our jobs are harder than the other person because then that gives us an excuse to ask for more money and pretend that we should be getting paid what we're getting paid, if not more. But the reality is that being a baseball GM it's hard. It really is. I appreciate that question. Okay, let's go to the next one. This was supposed to be so you want to talk to Samson, but I wanted to put this in the mailbag because I just wanted to touch on it because it made me smile a little bit. What is the weirdest reaction you have ever seen from a player who has just been traded or released. So you use the word weird, and I'm going to switch it because it's our show. I can do that. I'm going to make it to memorable. What was the most memorable reaction? I, I think it was weird also as I look back. In 2003, we won the World Series. Our first baseman was Derek Lee. We couldn't afford to keep him in 2004 because we won the World Series. We had a bunch of players getting natural raises. We wanted to try to repeat. We knew we were going to lose Pudge Rodriguez as our catcher because he was a free agent and was not going to sign a one-year deal like he did with us in 03. But we had to cut other places, even though our payroll went up. And we knew that we were going to trade Derek Lee. Derek Lee was our first baseman, the best first baseman well, we had Delgado in 05. I would say Derek Lee is the best first baseman I ever had in 18 years. And I, I think I'm probably saying that because we won the World Series, but he was such a good defender. So good. I mean, Delgado was a better offensive player, but Derek Lee just overall was, was phenomenal. But we had to trade him. And we traded him. We found a willing trade partner in the Chicago Cubs. And we got a player named Hesop Choi. He stopped Troy, came to us in 2003 in the offseason, played for us. I loved getting to know him. I loved having him in the lineup. There was just something about him that uh, he was a Korean player, and he loved the game. He cared about the game. He wanted to help us repeat. He had never won a ring. But during the 04 season, 
We traded Hesop Choi to the Los Angeles Dodgers in a trade for um, Paul LaDuca. So we were trading Hesop Choi and Brad Penny. We bring Hesop Choi into the office. I'll never forget this. It was Jack McKeon, Larry Bindfest, Mike Hill, and myself. We're in the manager's office. And when you trade a player, here's what happens. When it's during the season and it happens during a game, you have to pull the player from the field. When it's not finalized until post-game, which is how we prefer to do it, and the way a trade is finalized is there's been an exchange of medicals. The doctors say the medicals are clean. Then you say to the other team, we approve the medicals of the players we're acquiring. Then the other team says, we approve the medicals of the players we're acquiring. Then you submit a signed trade proposal, which is like a contract that is signed by both general managers. You submit that to Major League Baseball and they approve the trade. Then you go into the system and you literally remove the player you're trading from your roster and the player you're acquiring gets added to your roster. Because if you've got 25 players on your roster, your roster is full and you acquire a player, that player cannot appear on your roster until you take a player off your roster. And you don't want to put a player on the injured list. You don't want to release a player to take him off your roster. So you trade a player and baseball removes him from your roster and adds the player you're trading. That happens. Then before word leaks out, if possible, you tell the player. And the way you tell the player, I can't make this up. Michael Hill is calling while I am doing this. Mike, I'm literally recording the show where I just mentioned your name and then you called and you're live on the show right now, but I'm going to call you when I'm done taping. Okay. That literally was Michael calling as I'm telling the story of Michael and Larry and I and Jack McKeon. What we do is we have the bench coach go get a player. And when you are fetched as a player to the manager's office after a game, there's only one of two things that are happening. Three, three things. You're being released, you're being sent down to the minor leagues, or you've been traded. So we bring Hesop Choi in, it's post game. He walks in, he's in his uniform still. He has not gotten in the shower. He walks into Jack McKeon's office, he's taking his spikes off, he's got his shower shoes on with his pants and his uniform. And he sees the four of us there. He knows he's not gonna be released. He knows he's not going on the injured list. He's not hurt. And Larry says, he saw, and we had gotten to know him and we joke around with him. It was all great. He saw, we've traded you to the Los Angeles Dodgers. And that's how Larry would do it. That's how Mike does it. That's how I would do it and did do it. Very direct. You don't BS around when you send a player down. The way you send a player down, you bring him into the office and you say, we're going to send you to AAA. We want you to work on the following four things get down there, do your job, and we'll be in touch. When you trade a player, you say, hey, we've traded you to the Dodgers. He stop without pausing. It was instantaneous. He started to cry. It was so emotional. And I'm not an emotional guy. And I don't mean like tears of joy. He loved Florida. He loved being a Marlin. He was so happy and he was so sad to go. It impacted me. I remember it like it was yesterday. So he cried and he was standing up and we had him sit down in a chair in Jack's office. And we said, it's not you. We promise you the Dodgers wanted you and we needed catching and we needed to make this deal. And they wouldn't do the deal without you. He stopped. You're going to go to LA and you are going to succeed. You're going to be great. You're going to love that organization. We would say that even though we knew that our organization in our mind was better because we would take care of players better and that we were doing this trade with the, the GM at the time was not Andrew Freeman. It was a guy named uh, the guy from Moneyball played by uh, Jonah Hill. Uh, Paul D. Podesta, uh, I believe, was the GM of the Dodgers at that time. So he stopped. Troy cried. I remembered it. That was the most emotional, strangest, weirdest, saddest reaction to a trade. Some players just say thank you and walk out. Some players just walk out. Some players say, I'm going to prove you wrong. Some players say, what took so long? 
but he is to date the only player who we traded who ever cried at being traded. Thank you for that question. That was a good one. Okay, next. Oh, this is a personal one. What's been your biggest challenge in your career and how did you overcome it? I took this question and I don't know that I've answered it in full before, but I think I've touched on it. But I wanna open up and tell you what the biggest challenge I ever had in my career. And I'm gonna pretend that you mean the baseball career and not my career on Wall Street or not my career in Europe doing business. I'm gonna say in baseball and not my career here uh, with CBS doing nothing personal. So I'll amend the question, what's been your biggest challenge in your baseball career? And how did you overcome it? But you know what, Coca? By the way, Coca's doing this show today. No Mikey. Coca's doing the mailbag. Thank you, Coca, for that. Just what Coca wanted. Another episode. So I guess I would say this has been the biggest challenge in my career. It was the challenge I faced being a 31-year-old president of a Major League Baseball team whose stepfather was the owner. Walking into the office in a suit and tie, knowing that I'm being looked at, that it was straight nepotism. Who was I to be this young guy in charge? And I was president from age 31 to age 49. And as I got older and got more experienced, I got better at being team president. But one thing that I never was able to shake is the feeling that people were always judging me for being in the position I was in for no reason with no credentials other than the fact that I was the owner's son. And the way I would overcome that challenge when I was young is I would overcompensate, really using false hustle and eyewash by having 7 a.m. meetings, by trying to be firm and strong and serious, by trying to be who I wasn't. And the way I manage people is I manage by trying to gain a consensus, by trying to get as many opinions as I can, and then making a decision and sticking to a decision. When you're a leader, they only want you to make decisions, the people who work for you. And I've always been good at making decisions. I've not always been good at making the right decisions, but I've always been good at making decisions and understanding their impact and realizing that in order to make decisions, you need information. And in order to get information, you need to get people to talk to you. In order to get people to talk to you, you need to get smart people who understand the issues and understand how to articulate the issues so that I can make decisions. Actually, as president of a team, that's all you do is you don't do much except make decisions. You take two sides because you're presented two sides to everything and then you decide which way you're gonna go with. But the challenge for me was always trying to get people to look at me as president of the team and not as a member of the owner's family. And I would overcompensate by referring to the owner as Jeffrey or Mr. Loria. And I would always let people know, listen, Jeffrey has the right to fire me at all times. It doesn't matter that we're in the same family. I have a job to do and that's to run his business. And if I don't do it well, I'm gonna get fired. And if you don't do your job well, then I'm gonna have to fire you. And if that doesn't work, I'm gonna have to fire someone else because I don't wanna get fired. And it has nothing to do with being in the family. No president or GM wants to get fired. So you fire people below you if the job isn't being done well. And eventually there's no one left to fire and that's how you get fired. And it was always a challenge how to walk the line between family and business, between nepotism and the knowledge that I knew I could be good at this job, walking the line of jealousy that would exist in the family or jealousy that would exist with friends or other people in the company because they wanted the position I had. I always wanted people to want my job. I surrounded myself with people who wanted my job, but who who were loyal to me. You don't hire people who want your job who aren't loyal to you. You want people who want your job, but they're loyal to you and they know that they're gonna get their chance. If it's not with you, it'll be with another team. Did I overcome that challenge fully? I would say that in the last four years of my career, 
maybe five, starting in 2012 when the new ballpark opened, really started in 2009 when we got the ballpark deal done and we got the approvals from the public. That's when I felt that I had really earned my stripes. And then when I did the transaction and worked with a lawyer to get the team sold for Jeffrey when he wanted to sell it, I knew that I had been a good president for him and that I'd earned the right to be his team president. And I knew that people in the community and people who were our employees and people who were our players and community leaders and anybody looked at me not as the son of the owner, but as the president of the team. And there was no higher compliment than when I had employees come to me or when I had players or when I had staff members or other owners or other team presidents or con the commissioner, when I knew that they were treating me as an experienced, tenured, longtime executive, I knew that I had overcome that challenge. But it still creeps in every once in a while. You can't help it. When there's a family business and the son tells you that they're, or the daughter, that they don't think about the fact that they're in a family business, they're, they're not telling you the truth. It never fully goes away. It really doesn't. So I appreciate that question. That was my biggest challenge in my career. All right, let's go to the next question. Let's see. Oh, this is a long one. Oh, I like this one too. Okay, ready? I'm going to lead off saying you seem like a very direct person. <laughs> That's true. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. No, you're not. Do you have any issue managing or finding other very direct people to hire into your organization? I have a lot of young new college grads, folks working for me, and none of them can make a decision. I am very direct. Absolutely never try to be harsh to these folks because I don't want to trample any good ideas. But how do I get these new professionals to make a decision based on their best information? I'm in a service business, so we're not getting Ivy League people but they're all good people, hardworking, and totally scared of making a decision. Any thoughts? It just so happens I do have some thoughts. Let's talk about what it is to be a direct person versus what it is to be a decisive person. Those are two very different things. A direct person is someone who will tell you what they think and not make you guess. A direct person is someone who will not worry about your reaction to what they are thinking or doing. They only worry about your understanding of what you are thinking or doing. A decisive person is someone by definition who doesn't dither, someone who, as I said in the last question, takes information and then gives a definitive direction. Another word for being decisive is another Another word, how, how do you like that, Coca? Another word for being decisive is another word. It's being directional. It's having direction. What do people need to do their jobs? What's the first thing you need to do your job? Answer the question, Coca. What, do you, what is the first thing you need to do your job? People would say, I need a computer. People would say, I need a car. People would say, I need a salary. People would say, I need a boss. Do you know that all that's wrong? The first thing you need to do your job is to know your job. You need to understand exactly what is expected of you or else you have no chance of doing your job to say nothing of doing your job successfully. So I was always interested in letting people know exactly what their job was and when I was hiring, I looked for people who understood my direction as to what their job was and understood how to take my direction and make our company more profitable, make our team win more games. How do you get someone who's scared of making a decision to make a decision? I'm sorry to tell you that the answer is there's nothing you can do. I would always know whether or not someone is decisive during the interview process. 
You can tell by the way they carry themselves. You can tell by the way they look, by the way they dress, by the way they talk, by the way they think. I wouldn't ask questions in an interview. Hey, where do you see yourself in five years? I don't give a crap. I would ask questions that were real world situations. Okay. You get into work and two people come in your office. One person has the marketing plan and has two ideas to sell tickets. The other person is the salesperson and they've got a commission structure that they want to amend because they want to sell more tickets and they believe that the current commission structure will lead to salespeople selling a product that we are not going to sell much of. My job is to figure out how do I deal with the marketing guy who's trying to make something look good and try to help support the sales guy and the sales guy who's coming to me with a very practical issue about commission structure? What do you do? Those are the type of detailed scenarios I would bring up during interviews because I want to see the thought process and I want to see the decision. What I don't want to hear from someone is they say, I need more information. No, I've given you the information. This is the information you need. What's your decision? Well, I read in a book that when presented a interview question like this, I'm supposed to say, I need context. You're not going to get the job. I want someone to tell me exactly how they think, why they think what they think, and then what the result of their thought is. You can tell that from an interview. And if you got it wrong, you can tell it in the first two weeks on the job. But if you think that going to training or bringing in a motivational speaker or bringing in a life coach or bringing in a decision-making coach is going to turn non-decision makers into decision makers, you're in for a long, tough road in your business. I can promise you that. And don't be dissuaded. <clears throat> Excuse me. Don't be dissuaded by the fact that they're young or they didn't go to Ivy League schools. That has nothing to do with whether or not someone is decisive. You don't need a Harvard education to be decisive at all. It's a personality. My personality is direct. My personality can be off-putting to people because of being that direct. I don't want to waste time. You've heard me talk about a nothing personal. I don't want to bother doing a lunch meeting when I can get everything accomplished I need to before the menus are given. I know exactly what I want. I know exactly how to get what I want. And that manifests itself with everything I do and every word I say. Everything I do is with a purpose. Every word I say has a purpose. And when you work with me, you know it quickly. When I look at people who are hired or being hired, or when I look at people who are employees, I can tell if they're careful with their words. Just by having a conversation, you can tell people who are careful with their words. You also ask how you teach a professional to make a decision based on the best information. You're asking a question that is the oldest question in the book for business leaders. What you're really saying is, how do I tell if my employee is capable or not? Because capable employees, by definition, they are capable because they take information, they glean out like in a strainer, what's the best information, and then they make a decision based on that. I once had an employee who said, you know, I made a mistake because garbage in, garbage out. I didn't have the right information and I made a decision based on the wrong information. It was the best decision I could make based on what information I thought was correct, but it wasn't correct. Therefore, I made the right decision based on the wrong information. Therefore, it ended up being the wrong decision. That's not good enough for me. You've got to know whether or not the information you're getting is garbage. And the way you do it is by verifying it, by finding it through a different angle. I always tell people about legal research. Legal research, I learned to do this in law school. Do you know how you know you're done with legal research? When you go at an issue from five different directions and you keep getting the same case over and over as that case having the holding, which means the ruling, which means the law that you use as precedent when you are arguing another case, when your research keeps bringing you back to the same case, that means you've completed your research and you've got the best, most up-to-date 
and correct information. It's the same way in business. You know that you've got the best information when you go to enough people, when you've got an issue and they are all telling you the same thing. When you've got a leak in your roof and you have one roof guy come, you get a second opinion. What's causing that leak? It's the same thing as when you're trying to treat a disease you have. You don't go to one doctor. You get a second opinion. You take what they say, and then you make your best decision based on the best information of the doctor who knows the most about your specific situation. So it's not as though you teach people to make a decision on the best information. What you do is you make sure that you hire the people who understand what it is to get the best information. That's what can be hard. I wish you tons of luck in your company. People complain about having to hire millennials all the time. I don't complain at all about having young people. I love having young people. I love working with millennials. I love working with people who think they know more than I do. I love people who think that I'm old and I deserve to be put out to pasture. I'm in on all of it because I always get the last laugh because I'm never going to be put out to pasture and I'm using you for your energy. I'm using you for your life experience. Why do you think Coke and I get along so well? I'm using Coca left and right. He teaches me stuff every day. Every day I learn from him. I'm not too old to learn. I'm not so full of hubris, falsely granted hubris, that I can't learn more. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I guess I'm not old because I'm learning new tricks all the time. And running a company, you have to be willing to learn new tricks all the time. Okay. Ooh, that's a good one. Dear David, big fan from Mexico. Thank you. How realistic would it be for Mexico to have an MLB franchise? Was it ever seriously discussed? What prevented it from being taken into consideration if that is the case? That's a great question. I've talked about expansion of Major League Baseball and relocation a bit but I've never specifically discussed Mexico, and I want to. I had the opportunity in 2005 to go to Mexico where the rock, the Rockets, where the Astros and the Marlins participated in a exhibition series in Coca. I'm totally blanking. 2005, check it, Astros, Marlins, exhibition. I think it was Monterey is where we were. It wasn't Mexico City, but I'm totally blanking. A Coca may be absolutely out to lunch, which who would blame him? Um, but I think in 2005, the Astros and Marlins played Monterey. In any case, so we go down to Monterey and we were given an entire set of rules to go down there. I talked in a recent show, maybe it was this show. I can't remember when it was. I talked recently about the Dominican and some of the rules that took place when we would go to the Dominican. One of the rules is you have to have security. In Mexico, it was very clear. You may not leave your hotel without MLB security, no matter what, hard stop. It was deemed as unsafe. That to me was an immediate notification that there would never be Major League Baseball on a seasonal basis in Mexico. The reason why MLB was willing to play exhibition games, say it with me, why would MLB send exhibition games to Mexico? You got it. Money. Mexican support, Mexican TV, money, broadcast revenue. It was Mexico City? I was wrong, Coca. Maybe Monterey is the one that's safer than Mexico City. Maybe the reason we need security is Mexico City. Maybe it's both. Maybe expansion was being talked about in Monterey and not Mexico City. Either way, my answer doesn't change. Mexico is a hugely important market for Major League Baseball because of the revenue it produces, not just from people who buy licensed product, but because of the huge broadcast in deal that exists between baseball and Mexico. There is a very wealthy individual who sponsors the Mexican exhibition games, who wants to be a majority owner and wants to bring a team to Mexico. And what baseball has done has led him on for over a decade. And I'm sorry, baseball, for saying it, but that's all you've done. And I don't want to mislead any of the audience of nothing personal. I want to be truthful because that's what we do here. There will never be in my lifetime a team in Mexico. 
there is not 23 votes that will ever approve a team in Mexico because right now the owners get their cake and they get to eat it too. The cake is the revenue and they get to eat it because they don't have to go to road games in Mexico where they don't want to be. They don't want to worry about safety. They don't want to worry about not being able to drink the water or eat the lettuce. They don't want to be worried about stomach issues, Montezuma's revenge. They don't want to worry about any of that. But they will always, always take the money. And the way relocation works is that baseball keeps as many cities alive as possible in order to leverage the cities that are actually going to get the team. I've talked about this vis-a-vis -vis Montreal, which will never get another team because they can't get a stadium built. They can't get a good broadcasting deal. But they have Stephen Bronfman believe, and they've got the Tampa Bay Rays believe they could split their season in Montreal. And Bronfman believe that they could get a team in Montreal so he can run around and go to playoff games and go to the World Series and go to the All-Star game and make believe in Montreal that he's trying to be the hero. The numbers don't work. And that's the same in Mexico. So I'm sorry about that. And I appreciate that you're a big fan for Mexico. I really do. I actually enjoyed my time during those exhibition games. I got some great swag. I thought the stadium was great. I thought the players enjoyed it. I just didn't like the fact that we couldn't leave the hotel. I wanted to go around and sightsee in museums, et cetera. And we just were not allowed to do that. Thank you for that question. Okay. Next. Hey, David, your podcast is a must listen daily and I subscribe to 68 podcasts. So that's saying a lot. Holy cow. That's a lot of podcasts. Thank you very much. I posted this question with my five star review. Hopefully you can answer in the podcast. Well, I am. Whenever there's a playoff or World Series matchup of two large market teams, it's frequently said that the league is happy about this because it generates more shared broadcast revenue for the league. Can you please shed some light on how this works? How much more money would the Brewers get from a Yankees Cubs World Series versus a Mariners Reds World Series? Thanks in advance. Well, thanks for asking that question. I love talking about this as, as the president of two small market teams for 18 years. Let me explain what we're rooting for as an industry and why. Now, it's a simple answer. We're rooting to make the most money possible. The way it works with the broadcast deal, on an annual basis, the networks who broadcast baseball, ESPN, Fox, Turner, they pay an amount per year, and in return, they get to show regular season games and then a certain number of postseason games. The way they decide how much they're going to pay is based on the amount of revenue that they think they're going to get through ad revenue and through subscription revenue because they have a network that they sell to cable providers, they sell to streaming services, and they want content. In order to charge as much money as they can in advertising rates and in subscription rates, they want to have as many eyeballs as possible, and they want to be in the biggest markets as possible. That's why you see on Sunday Night Baseball, the Yankees and Red Sox playing every single week, and you never see the Marlins, no matter how good they are. That's because what they're selling is the larger markets, the larger DMAs. From a financial standpoint, once they do a deal with baseball, they do not get a refund if it's the Mariners Reds in the World Series. Baseball does not get a bonus if it's the Yankees and Dodgers in the World Series. Where that comes up is later during a renegotiation when the contract expires and you want to get more networks involved, you want to get more platforms involved, and you get to say, hey, Look what happens when the Yankees played the Dodgers in the World Series. Look at the eyeballs we got. <clears throat> Look at what you will be able to do to monetize that. 
we get to show these networks and platforms based on historical data. That is why we root for, as an industry, seven game series to go seven games, because even Mariners Reds game seven will attract more than a Yankees Reds game one. The later in the series, deciding games, elimination games, all get more eyeballs. They all attract more attention. So the more elimination games you can provide to your broadcast partners, the more they're willing to pay. That's why baseball expanded the playoffs and added those two out of three, because after game one, each of the next two, were they to go to a game three, were elimination games or deciding games, like a game seven in a seven game series or a game five in a five game series or a game three in a three game series. So there is a lagging impact on your revenue based on what happened during the course of the contract. That is why baseball historically is always rooting for big market teams. But there's a conundrum that the commissioner has because in owners meetings, when we get the list of the Sunday night games each year, there's ego involved. While we're very happy to take 1 30th of the contract, the ego says, my God, we're not a national game one time. How can that be? It's bad for baseball, we would always say, that you're always showing the Yankees or the Red Sox or the Cubs. Show the other teams. Let's build up personalities from the other teams. Let's try to globalize and nationalize our product. Let's try to bring more attention to the fact that there are other teams. We're always saying that because we want to be able to say to our fans and to our sponsors, hey, you want to be associated with the Marlins because look at us. We're a national brand. We're not just a local brand. That's what we say with our ego. What we say with our brain is, I totally understand why the Milwaukee Brewers never get a national game or the Miami Marlins never get a national game, no matter how good they are, no matter how great it is to see Christian Yelich who, by the way, played for both of those teams, because I know very well that my budget depends on huge billion-dollar broadcast deals and whatever the broadcast people want, darn it, we're just going to have to give in. So that is the reality of how that works. So the networks get to choose their schedule. What we say as an industry is, I know you want the Yankees every week, but the Yankees are not allowed to play Sunday night every week because the union doesn't want the players playing Sunday night every week. Because when you play a night game, you then have to travel, you get home late, you get into your city early if you're playing on the road the next day, even if you have an off day Monday, you don't want to play Sunday night games. You want to play afternoon games. On the other hand, the industry needs you to play Sunday night games. So what they do is they limit the number. You can only appear, let's say, seven times. And so what the network will do when they're putting their schedule together is they will give the maximum number of games they're legally allowed to do to the larger market teams. Yet there are some teams that could be on national television seven times that are on zero. So the networks get to schedule. Why is it when you're watching the playoffs that there's certain series that were always on during the afternoon while certain series were on during prime time? I promise you that was not because of baseball. That was not because of that's what the owners wanted. That was because that's what the broadcast partners want because more of you are watching prime time than are watching during the afternoon. I hear all of you complain. Why aren't there more afternoon games? Why aren't there more afternoon games? It's because you're not watching them and advertisers don't pay as much for them because you're not watching them. Therefore, it simply doesn't work. I loved afternoon games because 162 games, you play only 16, uh, you play 26 Sunday afternoon games, let's say. That's still basically 130 night games out of a year. That's a lot. I appreciate that question. That was a good one. Okay, last one. Please publish your list of top movie shows and books. What I've done on previous mailbag episodes, and you can find it on previous mailbag episodes, is I would do my, I gave you my top 100 list of movies. I gave you my top 25, I think, TV shows of all time. I think I gave you my top 10 books of all time. 
And I love that you want to see the list. I would love to publish it, except I don't know how. So I'm calling on you, Coca, to help me publish on Twitter, maybe on our pod page, on our homepage for the podcast, maybe on Instagram that we can pin it somehow or pin it for a while or retweet it every couple of weeks. But I want to find a way to get my list of top 100 movies, which I change if I see a movie that cracks the top 100, top shows, top books, top movies. I want to get that to you. I appreciate you asking that question. Well, the time is up for this mailbag episode. Have a very good Thanksgiving if it's today or tomorrow. Be safe, be smart. I appreciate your loyalty more than you know, and we will be back after Thanksgiving. We will be here every day. We will be bringing you trending topics, things that interest you, things that interest me. We will give it to you straight because on this show, if there's one thing that you've learned, it's just business. It's nothing personal. <laughs>